take your seat, please? Sorry, we're a little bit behind schedule, but uh, we'll, we'll get back on track here. I'm Jason Williams. I'm the CEO of Blackfoot, and I am delighted to be sponsoring this event to showcase the entrepreneurship ecosystem that we have going on here in Montana. Um, I would like to thank Dean Shannon O'Brien from the Missoula College for hosting this event. This is a spectacular facility she has here, I think one of the nicest on the entire University of Montana campus. And the great thing about Shannon is she is working with her team to develop and build a curriculum that is equally spectacular of the facility they have here. So thank you, Shannon. Uh, we certainly appreciate it. Uh, just a quick uh, note on the schedule. Sheila Stearns, the president of the University of Montana, is unable to speak today. And in her place, we have Commissioner Clay Christian. He'll be speaking. And then after the event, right out here in the breezeway, there will, um, there will be cocktails. So please stick around and, and enjoy. Um, I'd also like to thank all the folks that made this possible. Um, the, the funding from the Kauffman Foundation, uh, Montech, uh, Blackstone Launchpad, and the Montana High Tech Business Alliance. As a founding member of the Montana High Tech Business Alliance, Blackfoot has a keen interest in entrepreneurship. Um, but, but that, it's really much more than an interest. You know, Blackfoot, 60 years ago, we started from a bunch of entrepreneurs. A bunch of entrepreneurs living up the Blackfoot River Valley that strung copper wire among large trees and along fence posts to bring voice services throughout the Blackfoot River Valley. And so our role has changed. Today, Blackfoot's a $50 million a year company. And our role changes as that from from one of being entrepreneurs to encouraging entrepreneurs. And we're doing that in a variety of ways. And the primary way we're doing that is by giving entrepreneurs in Montana some of the building blocks and the basic infrastructure to be able to run their businesses and, and to grow. In 2017, Blackfoot is investing more than $15 million in broadband infrastructure in Montana. And we're doing that in Bozeman, and we're doing it in Missoula, Kalispell, but we're also doing it in some of Montana's smaller communities like St. Ignatius, in Thompson Falls, in Phillipsburg. And it's these sort of essential building blocks, broadband, things that the report talks about, access to air service, things that community leaders in Missoula and Bozeman know very well, like affordable housing. It's all of these tangible things that are necessary to have a successful entrepreneurship ecosystem. But Montana, we have something more. We have a very big impact. It's Montana, right? I mean, we have mountains that the author John Steinbeck fell in love with, right? We have got rivers that are cool and clean that have fostered these subcultures of recreation and fly fishing and surfing. You know, here in Missoula, we've got surfers under the Higgins Street Bridge every night. But we also, have, um, we also have people, right? The report that you're going to hear today talks about some of the people, some of the hard-working people. One of the, the paragraphs in the report talks about how the entrepreneurship workforce in Montana is gutsy. I love that. I love that, that we have this notion in Montana, pulling ourselves up by the bootstrap, taking risks, and getting things done. So with that, I'd like to uh, uh, welcome you all. Uh, it's a great event. We're doing this again tomorrow in Bozeman. Um, so let's get on with it. I'd like to hand it over to uh, a gentleman that needs uh, no introduction when it comes to innovation and entrepreneurship. Governor Steve Bullock, I had the honor of attending your innovation, Innovate Montana conference in Billings last year. It was fantastic. It was a great venue for entrepreneurs to get together, think, talk, share ideas. And I'm excited to go again this year. So ladies and gentlemen, Governor Steve Bullock. so much and also I think mark your calendar July 11th is the next Innovate Montana Summit but it's great to be here to see both familiar faces that have been making a meaningful difference around the state and a few new friends as well it's an exciting time to be in Montana our economy is strong and growing unemployment rates about 3.8 percent lowest it's been in about a decade 
2,000 new jobs uh, created since the start of January alone. More people are working in Montana than ever before in our state's history. For the last four years, our focus has included making sure that we're growing our economy, creating that economic opportunity for Montanans in every corner of our state. And we've made substantial progress. We are experiencing strong business and job growth. Wages are increasing. Montana's among the leaders in household income growth across the country. We work to make state government that much more efficient, cost-effective, responsive to the needs of the people that we serve. Save taxpayer dollars by implementing innovative cost-saving measures, made it easier for Montana entrepreneurs to start a business and interface with the state of Montana. And we've been working and engaging in unprecedented partnerships between Main Street businesses all across the state and state and local government. A spring in Montana is in full swing, and I say that knowing it could be snowing in two minutes from now. I think, though, that we have a lot to be excited about, and a great deal of our current success really is a reflection of the hard work and effort that all of you actually create and cause for our state each and every day. Your commitment to growing Montana's economy, creating more high-paying jobs, and revitalizing communities is certainly vital to our success. We know that small businesses and entrepreneurs, reflected by many of you in this room, really are what drives our economy, and we've worked to foster that entrepreneurial spirit that runs deep in our state. Our entrepreneurs are innovators. Small businesses and Montanans have found ways to compete with big box stores and internet-based retailers, thrive in a competitive environment. They figured out ways to provide services from Montana that touch, indeed, the entire world. Montana has been recognized by the Kauffman Foundation as the number one state in the nation for entrepreneurship for the past four years, and that's for good, good reason. The rest of the world is starting to notice. I think uh, the New York Times said it best when they said Silicon Valley gets all the glory, but the real hotbed of American entrepreneurship appears to be a few hundred miles to the northeast Montana. Now, the New York Times doesn't quite have figured out how far it is from San Francisco to Montana, but that often happens on the coast. It's, the report that you're going to hear about today really helps underscore how Montana continues to punch above its weight. From our talent and trained workforce to the grit of Montanans, or gutsy, as you said, Montanans, from our quality of life to our accessibility to government and government officials from our positive business climate to the willingness of a neighbor or a stranger to lend a hand and mentor other businesses and entrepreneurs. Montana really is on a great path, and the innovators and entrepreneurs among us are helping lead the way, as are the future generations of Montanans. So thanks for being here, and thanks for highlighting that Montana truly is the best place to live, work, raise a family, and start business. Certainly appreciate that. Do I get introduced to the commissioner? Uh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> now we'd like to introduce Deborah Granton, who will read a letter from Senator John Tester. Thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Deborah Franson. I'm the Regional Director for Senator John Tester here in Missoula. Our office is located conveniently next to the top hat, so if at any time, <laughs> if at any time our office can be of help to you, I hope you'll drop on by, we'd love to see you. And this is from a message from Senator Tester. I want to thank the Montana High Tech Business Alliance, Montech, and the Blackstone Launchpad for putting together this critical report. It's no longer a secret, Montana is open for business. People born and raised in Montana know it's the best state in the country to live and work. And this report confirms what a lot of us have known to be true. There is no better place in the country to start a business, launch a career, create jobs than right here in Montana. Montanans don't brag about their business success. They just roll up their sleeves and continue to create jobs and strengthen the economy. Missoula is currently home to entrepreneurial activity that is nearly unparalleled across the country. Business startup, startups are succeeding in Missoula because they have access to top-notch workforce and legal experts that are quick to lend entrepreneurs a hand. 
The University of Montana is meeting the business needs of the community and providing entrepreneurs with job-ready employees that are eager to live and start a family in Western Montana. For employers, it's hard to imagine a better community to recruit and retain a workforce than in Missoula. Missoula has unmatched access to our public lands, including the Bitterroot Valley, Rattlesnake Wilderness, and the world-famous Blackfoot River. In fact, in fact, a Missoula entrepreneur can leave the office after work and be floating the Clark Fork River 15 minutes later. When you combine a well-trained workforce and unmatched quality of life with a friendly tax environment and a strong support network, you create one of the best entrepreneurship ecosystems in the country here in Missoula, Montana. This was the economic potential I saw in Missoula when I helped launch the Blackstone Launchpad at the University of Montana in 2013. The Blackstone Launchpad has helped folks in Missoula write a business plan, network, and secure the financing they need to take their idea from their notepad to Main Street. That entrepreneurial spirit is alive and well in Missoula, and I can't wait to see what the future holds for Missoula and the surrounding communities. Thank you for participating in today's presentation and for your contribution to creating jobs and growing the Montana's economy. Thank you, Senator John Tester. Please welcome Spencer Merwin, Director of Coalitions and Outreach for Senator Steve Daines. <clears throat> All right, good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Christina said, my name is Spencer Merwin. Um, I am uh, the Director of Coalitions and Outreach for Senator Danes, uh, working here in Missoula. Deborah mentioned that um, they are conveniently located next to the Top Hat. We are conveniently located next to the Dram Shop, so uh, <laughs> not sure if that's a reflection on Missoula or, or Senators or both. But uh, either way, that's where we are. Be happy to have you stop by and visit at any point. Uh, the Senator wanted me to share these remarks with you today. Thank you for the invitation to take part in Missoula's Entrepreneurial Forum and for all the work you do to equip and educate aspiring entrepreneurs throughout our state. As your Senator, ensuring our state continues to cultivate and reward the entrepreneurial spirit is one of my highest priorities. Before serving as your Senator and Representative, I spent 28 years in the private sector, with 13 of them helping grow a small tech business into Bozeman's largest commercial employer. For decades, Montana has provided a good ecosystem for this type of startup activity, and I'm deeply committed to ensuring that this ecosystem continues. Montana has nurtured tech startups and entrepreneurial ventures to become the envy of industry leaders like Oracle, which continues to operate its global cloud command center in my hometown of Bozeman, which continues to provide hundreds of good paying jobs to neighboring communities. While business growth has, made, has been made possible partially through the strong work ethic of Montanans, businesses also continue to greatly benefit from what Montana outdoors have to offer. When marketing right now technologies, we would often say, come work where you want to play. As Montanans, we know that our quality of life is second to none, and the opportunities to recreate, hunt, fish, and camp on our beautiful landscapes truly make Montana the last best place. As you, as you grow and nurture entrepreneurship in your own communities, please consider me an active partner in continuing to keep Montana not only the last best place to live, but also the last best place for startups as much of my career was spent in your shoes. I have no doubt this important forum of some of our brightest will be beneficial to the Montana tech community for years to come. If I can ever be of assistance, please do not hesitate to reach out to me through any of our offices here in Montana or in Washington, D.C. Thank you, and God bless. Steve Deans. Please welcome Clayton Christian, Commissioner of Higher Education for the Montana University System. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. I suppose uh, you figured out by now you got kind of the raw end of this deal with Sheila gone and me here. But uh, she is ill, um, has laryngitis, which doesn't help too much for these type of deals. And uh, she told me that I could either come in and fill in for her today or I could fill in for the next couple weeks if she doesn't get to feeling better. So <laughs> it's a pleasure to be here. Um, first of all, I'd just like to say uh, welcome to Missoula College. Welcome to this new facility. Uh, second time in about a week and a half that I've had the privilege of being here. The uh, views of the river won't get old anytime soon. Uh, it's a spectacular place and certainly uh, deserves some appreciation to the governor, the uh, 63rd legislature, and many business partners that brought this facility forward. It was one of the first times uh, in the history of how we fund buildings in the university system that uh, the governor and the legislature said uh, we'll help with part of it, but we're going to ask business to help with part of it. And 
it's fitting that uh, Blackfoot is our sponsor here today because they were a, a huge contributor uh, on the match requirement uh, to get this facility done, so we, we greatly thank them. And whether it's fate or destiny or somewhere in between, I think it's very fitting that, that this uh, convening is here on campus today because I think, as the report well points out, uh, one of the important attributes of a successful economy and a successful entrepreneur enterprise in uh, Montana is its link with higher education and the resources that we can provide and uh, the tie to a, a, an educated workforce that we ultimately can produce. And so whether it's uh, the work done by BBER through the Montana High Tech Alliance or the Governor's Main Street Montana Project um, or this study, they all point to that very tight link between higher education and business and entrepreneurship. And we're uh, so grateful to, to be a part of it here in Montana uh, and, and part of that economic growth. We know we have work to do uh, for the first time uh, really in the history of the university system and Department of Labor in Montana. I'm proud to report that a couple years ago we hired a joint appointment and we're starting to look at what the workforce needs are uh, for the state but then also how they tie in with what programs are relevant uh, within our curriculum, what talent is in the pipeline and ultimately how we can bring that talent to bear for uh, Montana. So as you move forward with your work, as, as we uh, help support entrepreneurship in Montana, we ultimately know that the end goal is to create jobs and that those jobs uh, can be filled by hardworking Montana citizens and we're uh, proud to be a part of that piece. So we look forward to working with you in the future and uh, without further ado, I'm anxious to hear what the panel has to say. Thank you. I am Christina Henderson, the Executive Director of the Montana High Tech Business Alliance. And in February of 2016, a group of entrepreneurs who convened for a CEO roundtable that we hosted in Bozeman, entrepreneurs from all around Montana, had the brainchild that produced the report that is in front of you today. Um, we, for the last four years running, Montana has been the number one state for startup activity per capita according to the Kaufman Index of Entrepreneurship. So more than a year ago, it was our third year running, but the entrepreneurs around the table said, why don't we approach the Kaufman Foundation and see if they would be interested in studying why this is the case and what it is about Montana that has generated such an incredible rate of startup activity. So I traveled down to uh, Kansas City almost a year ago. I think Yaz Motoyama and I first met in May of 2016. And we were very fortunate to meet an incredible researcher who had authored a number of case studies about entrepreneurial ecosystems all across the country. He'd done studies on Kansas City, Indianapolis, Chattanooga, but all of the studies to date had been in urban areas. And there hadn't been any research yet on what entrepreneurship looks like in a rural state like Montana and in small cities like Missoula and Bozeman and some of the very small towns that we did study in, as part of this uh, report. And Yaz was interested, was willing to, to tackle this study with us. He helped us to secure funding from the Kaufman Foundation to uh, support the research. And this is actually his third trip to Montana, his first to Missoula, but he's been to Bozeman twice to teach us how to conduct the research. Paul Gladen from the UM Launchpad and I traveled around the state um, and interviewed entrepreneurs and support professionals all across Montana. Um, and Yaz has been an incredible partner in this research. He's um, helped us to produce a, a report that has um, substantial academic rigor and also to give us a uh, credibility from outside of the state to help us see what's really going on here in Montana. Uh, Yaz, Yaz Motoyama, PhD, 
is an incoming assistant professor at the Department of Geography and School of Business at the University of Kansas. He was previously director of research at the Ewing Marion Kaufman Foundation and a postdoctoral scholar at the University of California, Santa Barbara and the University of California, Los Angeles. He holds a BA with triple measures in history, international relations, and political science from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, a Master of Public Administration from Cornell University, and a PhD in city and regional planning from the University of California, Berkeley. Please join me in welcoming Yas Moriyama, PhD. for the kind introduction, uh, Christina, and it's my pleasure to be here. Uh, first time in Missoula. Uh, it was very nice yesterday. It's a little sprinkled today, but uh, <laughs> even better, I was just looking at the view from that window, a fantastic view of mountain, clouds, and the sky. And no wonder great people live here and stay here. Um, academics have studied the regional entrepreneurship systems uh, here after ecosystem studies. And uh, as Christina mentioned, most of them are, um, sorry, and um, as Christina mentioned, it has been mostly in the large cities. Um, people know a lot about the Silicon Valley now, uh, but uh, Washington, D.C., Atlanta, and Phoenix. Um, so it's to a large size metropolitan areas. And um, the next category, uh, I, this is something my collaborators and I have contributed, so St. Louis, Kansas City, and Indianapolis. And we have pushed down to Chattanooga, um, Tennessee, which is, still has a half a million inhabitants. Um, and that was kind of the limit that I was feeling uh, before I launched this Montana project. Um, some, of the, some of you might have read uh, Brad Fell's book, uh, Startup Communities, um, which talks about the border. And technically, its population is uh, smallest among these, uh, about 300,000. Uh, but I'd like to separate that case because that's right next to Denver. That's like another 5 million population area. Um, so basically, the academic studies have never studied small um, cities. And the focus of those academic studies has been uh, what kind of elements constitute the ecosystem. And they identified more or less uh, these six conventional elements. Uh, first, you know, if you start the company, you need the money, so you need finance, you need incubators, you need talent or skilled labor, you need university and its research activities, you need customers and support organizations. And in the meantime, there are several things unexplained about how each of these elements function as a system. And even within this framework, some of these elements are unclear. Um, and you know, in addition to these six elements, there's actually an element zero, entrepreneurs. And some people talked about the, uh, we need a critical mass of entrepreneurs. Uh, but what does it mean to be a critical mass? Like a few dozens, a few hundreds, so we need you know, millions of entrepreneurs. Uh, we really didn't know yet. And for some other elements, uh, okay, we need customers, but um, do, uh, do we need a very large market to support the you know, starting and growing companies? Or uh, if we talk about the support organizations, um, are we, uh, and uh, dense sub, uh, networks of support, are we talking about the quantity of support organizations, or are we talking about quality of support networks? Um, so in that sense, there are several questions still unanswered. And this is the visual of this um, ecosystem by Dan Eisenberg at the Babson College. And it looks nice. Um, you know, policy, place, finance, culture, all the um, same elements, kind of differently phrased. And, uh, but at the same time, this chart tells that every entrepreneurship ecosystem needs to have these elements. And if you don't have one, or if you are missing one, you need to strengthen it. And as a review of these past studies on entrepreneurship ecosystem, I find three major annotations. Uh, first, there are some regions with the presence of all these elements that have a very poor entrepreneurial performance. And, um, Atlanta and Buffalo, New York may be the prime examples. 
And second, um, the studies have assumed that entrepreneurship is a local phenomenon, um, kind of meaning that local inputs shape local entrepreneurial outcome. Uh, but this local means, uh, and you know, the studies usually agree that local means something like a metropolitan area, not exactly city, and something smaller than the state. Uh, but it's quite vague about what exactly it means to be local. And third, maybe the most important uh, limitation, uh, there is an assumption uh, that small places are disadvantageous in entrepreneurship because they lack some of these elements. So with those background thoughts, we started this Montana project last summer, and we reflected these thoughts um, in a research design. Uh, first, we made it ex intentionally exploratory studies, uh, and our main research question was how does the ecosystem in Bozeman and Missoula function? And we were looking at it from the entrepreneur's perspective. So um, we are not relying on existing framework of ecosystem, um, and as we did not ask, like, who are the major players in your ecosystem? Which element lacks here? We didn't really ask those. Instead, we asked the companies, and I would like to uh, thank again for the company interviewees. Uh, some of them may be present here. We asked, like, what kind of business do you operate? What kind of challenges have you faced? Um, who helped you? What kind of inputs did you receive? So, you know, from the entrepreneur's perspective, we tried to reconstruct how this ecosystem functions. And after interviewing uh, 30 companies, and of those uh, 12 companies, uh, startup companies, and 18 of them are more like a growth scale-up companies, we uh, identify the support companies mentioned by the entrepreneurs. Uh, second, we stratify the sampling of the total of the 42 companies, and uh, interview method can be easily criticized. That you know, if you interview someone you know, and if you ask the referral from those people, you are basically just in, uh, interviewing the same kind of people. Um, so, you know, no wonder, like, um, if we go and ask the companies, um, how do you think about, you know, ecosystem, what kind of help did you receive? And, you know, half of the people will say, well, Montana had a business alliance. Um, that is, you know, nothing um, surprising. Um, so to avoid that, um, we did use one, 27 inside network interviewees, but we intentionally cultivated 15 outside uh, networks by using web, uh, magazines, and many other information. And third, in addition to the interviews, we also surveyed 178 companies. Uh, this was distributed by the Bureau of Business and Economic Research by the University of Montana, so I'd like to um, acknowledge them. And the response were, rate was, uh, fascinatingly, 39.9%. Uh, um, you might see that in a corporate survey, some people publish papers with a 2 or even 5% um, response rate. Uh, so this is very good response rate. And I'd like to jump on to the findings. Uh, findings 1, the um, Montana um, regions have a very high levels of entrepreneurship. And Governor mentioned already, and uh, Christine also mentioned, and that the state level Montana has been ranked high, but this has a limitation because the, uh, the state level data includes uh, farmers and ranchers. And if they are counted as entrepreneurs, um, sure, more rural areas can be counted as entrepreneurial places. But in our case, um, there is some other data looking at the uh, labor market areas. This is kind of close to the metropolitan areas, and there are 394 of them. And the study, those, that study have ranked Missoula as the ninth highest and Bozeman as the 12th highest um, entrepreneurship place in the US. And there has been a very active spin off from Right Now Technologies. Um, and, well, I don't need to explain it here, uh, but there have been more than a dozen companies out of this. And the very center of this circle, um, Greg Forte, is sitting somewhere in this room. Um, Montana ha enjoys a very high um, ratio of ink first growing companies. Um, of course, we have to normalize it by the population, uh, but as we looked at it, Bozeman is very high, um, as high as the Washington DC, which is number one um, in the US. And also, there has been a very increasing uh, private equity, venture capital investment uh, in Montana, um, especially since mid 19 uh, teens, um, after the establishment of the next frontier uh, capital. 
Um, but at the same time, I'd like to provide a little more nuanced description of this. The increase in private equipment um, is good overall to the region, uh, but it doesn't define the success of the region per se, or it doesn't really determine the types of growth that companies should be pursuing. Um, you, uh, financing method um, and you know, the different ways to pursue um, entrepreneurship is different by entrepreneurs. So in Montana, we have noticed that there is a very high use of bootstrapping. Um, so you kind of start very small, uh, almost no capital, uh, but you get the revenue from the customers and you use that money to grow. Or you uh, start very small, um, organically, uh, mostly from your savings, um, so less than you know, $100,000, uh, but you grow it organically and you can still scale it up later on. Findings two, uh, small degrees of separation uh, is the bottom, uh, bottom of the uh, very dense network of support um, in Montana. And um, I won't be reading this quote, um, all of it, um, but you know, first thing I want to mention is the um, openness. Uh, people know resources in the area and people are willing to help other people. And second, um, this small degree of separation includes uh, government and elected officials, uh, which was unheard for me in my previous studies. Um, entrepreneurs hardly mention government, um, or if they mention it, was usually in a negative context, such as this regulation is bad, um, that permission is onerous. Um, so in Montana, governors, senators, um, city government, economic development agencies are accessible and helping entrepreneurs. Three, findings three, Montana companies enjoy excellent workforce. Um, they have hired uh, graduates from a number of research and technical co co colleges, so University of Montana and Montana State University are needless to mention. But some other uh, colleges are mentioned, such as Montana Tech, um, Highlands College. And, um, you, know, com you know, entrepreneurs repeatedly mention that the, uh, you know, workforce is excellent, and it doesn't really matter which um, universities they are graduating from. One manufacturing company mentioned that um, they, are, um, they have been able to hire aerospace-grade welding um, skill force. And also, uh, with the Montana companies and Montana employees, um, there is a very high retention rate with no sense of entitlement. Uh, Silicon Valley may be known as the very high cluster of highly skilled labor force, uh, but you know, that's kind of the place with a highly uh, workforce with a um, sense of entitlement. I, was, I spent seven years there, so I know quite well. <laughs> they need a high salary, and they need increasing salary, and they need BMW or Lexus, and you know, even after those, they still leave the company after two years anyway. Uh, but in Montana, uh, people stay with the company and provide the strength. Uh, but at the same time, there are some concerns about hiring in a large scale, uh, like dozens of people uh, in the region. And findings number four, uh, Montana companies have multi-locational inputs and national reach. Uh, one service company hires, uh, uh, organizes the virtual customer service staff, uh, basically the, you know, uh, using the telephone line. The, uh, but this company hires uh, people from small towns very specifically, and all the um, customer service staff are located remotely in several uh, small towns. And the company says um, it is be precisely because these are the super customer service people. Uh, the people from small towns are the ones who want to spend extra minute with the customers. Uh, that is not the case for people from many other uh, many large cities. Um, there is a company uh, that organizes um, 16 remote engineers. Uh, they know that finding excellent software engineers is always difficult, um, so they rather go for the uh, virtual platform. And the C chief technology officer is located in Los Angeles, and the, but other people are based in Buenos Aires, Argentina, um, Halifax, Canada, uh, Prague, uh, Costa Rica, um, and that is possible. Uh, but please note that I don't mean to 
uh, present a very naive and optimistic view that it's the digital age and companies can operate anywhere. But my point here is that the certain specific functions um, can be organized very creatively. Um, and small population basis does not inhibit Montana entrepreneurs. And finally, uh, finding number five, um, support activities by the entrepreneurship support organizations and attending events and programs by entrepreneurs go way beyond your hometown. So um, this is kind of different from the assumption of entrepreneurship is largely a local phenomenon. Um, I probably don't need to explain here, but you know there is a very high traffic uh, between Bozeman and Missoula, that's like 200 miles in distance. And so companies located in Bozeman attend events in Missoula or vice versa. Uh, there are some other companies um, you know, located in Lewistown, but regularly meets a mentor in Billings. Um, company based in Malta um, attend events in Hav, Bozeman, uh, Alispel, or um, well, many other examples we were finding. And this is kind of uh, constructing from our survey that um, two of our uh, well used, uh, well uh, used resources, Montana High Tech Business Alliance, that's kind of the um, orange, um, and where the companies were located, we kind of calculated the distance, and of course there is a company located in the same place using it very highly, but as you see, it has a very long tail, and the jump here at 200 miles um, very likely means that um, the high traffic between Bozeman <coughs> and Missoula. Uh, same for the uh, Montana State Universities, um, and uh, you can see the same figures. Uh, for the um, you know successful entrepreneurs serving as a mentors, um, just as a two example, uh, Greg Gianforte of Right Now and uh, Mike Fitzgerald of uh, Submittable, we kind of looked at it the same way, and uh, still the very similar patterns. Um, you know, people use it from 100 miles away, uh, 200 miles away or even 300 miles away. And I'd like to, I'm excited to share this network analysis. So this is coming from 178 companies. And basically we asked the companies, which of the following has been beneficial to your companies? And we listed 65 resources. Uh, I really appreciate the each respondent who went through each of the 65 uh, resources and um, answered. And, um, well, we first set up so that the, all the rows and columns of the modularity matrix sums to zero. That's the first equation. Um, but, you know, um, by the second equation, uh, looks looking very boring by now to everyone. So let's jump <laughs> onto the network. And it looks like this. <laughs> Um, so I'd like to discuss the linkage between the Montana High Tech uh, yeah, Business Alliance and the company and the Dorsey and Whitney uh, low company service, but this is actually very hard to see, yes I admit. Um, I was okay with um, math and statistics, but I have never been a good art student, so this is kind of the limit I can present. Um, instead, um, there is something more traditional called the tables. Um, we identified uh, four communities of the resource use. Uh, group one, um, kind of a yellow, um, we, that comes with the uh, 14 support organizations such as Montana Manufacturing Extension Center, um, Montana uh, Research Commercialization uh, Technology Grant, a job service, uh, Senator Dane, City of Bozeman, Senator Tester, uh, and there are uh, eight other resources identified here. Uh, group two, um, entrepreneurs highly use the bootstrapping. Uh, they have also got the referral from Montana High Tech Business Alliance. Um, Greg Gianforte, uh, referrals from Dorsey and Whitney, Launchpad at Montana State University and Montana Code School, etc. And group three used more financial resources and government uh, resources. And group four, um, used the uh, University of Montana <coughs> resources, Montech came up, and uh, governors, referrals, and Hellgate Venture Network. 
And um, I tested by the revenue size of the company and industry of the companies. And there are some light statistical tendency with that you know, company size and industries, but there seems to be something else uh, demarcating the use of resources by entrepreneurs. And I'm an outsider, uh, so I don't see it very clearly. But some local people told me that these boundaries may be formed uh, around political affiliations. <laughs> Uh, so please keep that in mind. Uh, so to summarize, uh, small towns in Montana exhibit high entrepreneurship uh, with several factors combined. Uh, and one was small degree of separation and openness. Uh, two was excellent workforce from many colleges. Three, a multi-locational team and inputs. And four, support beyond their hometown. And this really means that the Montana has a fundamentally different yet functioning entrepreneurship ecosystem. <coughs> and I hope that some of these findings in our research um, will be helpful for you and the panel after this. Um, I'd like to highlight three implications for now. First, uh, keep building Montana-like companies with Montana unique assets. Um, this entrepreneurship ecosystem, regional entrepreneurship ecosystem, does not have a linear path. Um, instead, it's highly heterogeneous. And you guys are standing at the front of this entrepreneurship ecosystem development. Uh, so you really don't need to be imitating Silicon Valley or Border um, or some other places. Uh, but you should be coming up with your own way of where your ecosystem should be headed next. Second. Um, discuss regional talent strategies. And there are, I like, this is a little bit um, kind of uh, difficult thing, and the university's role is critical here, but at the same time, I'd like to um, add some cautions. Um, you can't just expect everything to, for university to produce the lacking talent, whatever it is. Um, and because there are certain kinds of general skills that universities um, are able to train. Um, and also there is a different demand for talent. Um, that may be very specific to each company, but that may not very easily aggregate to the regional level. Um, and of the ones we have heard, uh, some companies said we need more junior programmers, some other companies said we need more senior programmers, uh, other companies said we need you know, like more like mid-level managers, uh, some other companies said we need more senior level managers. Um, how exactly universities can you know, respond to these uh, demand um, is rather unclear. Um, so we need to be really, um, you know, sitting down with the university people and kind of discuss what kind of talent is really needed, uh, but do try not to aggregate it up very easily. And, um, you know, let's not just ask a university to train uh, like some very big skills, but just say like, you know, we need more STEM people. That's easy to say, but it is not clear, you know, let's say, you know, a chemistry trained person will be needed for this you know, company, like you know, growing cluster, growing companies in the IT sector. That is very unclear. Um, you may need to import some of the talent externally, and this will not be easy either. Um, it's, you know, the good talent is needed everywhere. Uh, so it's not just like, you know, if you try to recruit in Seattle or some other places, those people will come. But you will be competing with those places as well. And you will, may need to discuss, you know, what kind of people will be needed. Um, and, you know, maybe including foreign nationals. Uh, what kind of environment is needed for the talent that you'll be recruiting? Uh, number three. Uh, create support environment beyond political boundaries. And it's, it is natural to give a referral to someone you are close, and there's nothing wrong with it. Um, however, it will start to limit the potential of the region and the economy uh, if your referral is only constrained by somewhat politically similar groups. And when uh, entrepreneurs grow their companies, uh, that will benefit the whole region. Um, therefore, the support environment should be inclusive to all entrepreneurs. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, that's it for my presentation. Uh, but um, I think the time is pressing. And uh, I think the more exciting panel is coming up. Um, so um, I think.
know, maybe I can take one or two super burning questions for the clarification of the presentation, but for the actual you know, topic, like discussion of the topics, I think um, it will be better if you can ask to some of the panelists coming up next. Please join me in giving a warm grab one on the way in, we have um, a one sheet that summarizes the results of the study and at the bottom there is a URL where you can download the full digital version of the report and we do have a limited number of printed copies of the report available um, by request if you ask um, after the program and we would like to thank Advanced Technology Group for their sponsorship of the printed materials today. Now if we could welcome our panelists up to the stage. It is my pleasure to introduce our facilitator today, Greg Gianforte, the founder of Right Now Technologies. Greg is also the board chair of the Montana High Tech Business Alliance. Um, and three years ago, almost exactly, um, he and a, a board, a group of board members in Bozeman uh, launched the alliance with 20 founding members. They were willing to hire me here in Missoula and to really demonstrate tangibly that we do have a statewide and interconnected entrepreneurial business community in high tech. We've since grown the organization to 315 member companies. But Greg and his wife Susan started Right Now Technologies over 20 years ago at their kitchen table in the same home where they raised their four children. Greg and Susan grew their company into Bozeman's largest commercial employer and created over 500 Montana jobs with an average wage of nearly $90,000. Greg earned degrees in electrical engineering and computer science from Stevens Institute of Technology. He also received honorary doctorates in computer science and engineering from Montana State University and Stevens <laughs> Institute of Technology. Please join me in welcoming Greg Gianforte. Thank you for being here, and Yaz, thank you for the work that you did. It's really exciting. We knew we had something special going on. It's nice to have it verified by someone outside. As Christina mentioned, uh, we started the High Tech Business Alliance three years ago as an apolitical trade organization for the industry. We didn't know how big high tech was in Montana. And uh, it's been amazing to see companies just come out of the woodwork and join. We hit a big milestone this January where University of Montana surveyed high tech and we realized that the total revenue of high tech in Montana now exceeds one billion dollars a year. It's the fastest growing sector in the state. I think it's something we can be really proud of. Um, and it's a great complement for our traditional industries of ag and tourism, uh, manufacturing, um, and natural resources. So. Uh, with no further ado, I'm thrilled to have this panel with us. Uh, they're really the focus of this discussion to add some color to the academic rigor that Yaz presented to us. Uh, we're going to hear some of the stories. So I'm going to ask each one to start off and just get share in two to three minutes about a little bit of your story and your business and kind of where you are. And then we'll dive in a little deeper. So Paige, you want to go? Sure, thanks. Um, I just wanted to say a special thank you to the Montana High Tech Alliance because without it, we wouldn't have all this information pulled together. And so congratulations to you and Christine for this. Um, my name is Paige Williams. I'm the founder and CEO of the Audience Awards. And it was a quick 10 second walk from Montec to this seat. So that was super nice. Um, part of, I agree with you guys, everything you presented, part of the success of my company is based on the support and the foundation that Montana has offered me and groups like Montec and Joe and and the bank and Liz and everybody's here, you know, and Don back there. And these partners have allowed me to start a company here in Missoula that is international. We run branded film contests and filmmaking challenges and film festivals all around the world, uh, all based from Missoula. And I always get, can she really do this from Missoula, Montana? And the answer is yes, we are. <laughs> and it's a wonderful thing. So we're a filmmaking community of over 150,000. We can grow up to 10% a week. People come and consume content on our site and create videos and provide opportunities to work with other brands and creating video content. And the audience gets to engage with that. We've been around for three and a half years. And I have to say that I love the part of the last slide 
that said we don't need to be Silicon Valley and we don't need to be Boulder. We can't be. And I'm really happy that we're Montana. Because without being in this ecosystem of Montana, I would not have been able to do the Audience Awards. And you can check us out at theaudienceawards.com. <laughs> I too want to thank Greg and the Montana High Tech Alliance for all you've done to create this ecosystem. Um, the ecosystem existed before you started, but you've really been the nurturing leader that has really brought this forward with Christina's leadership here in Missoula. I always want to thank you for putting Christina here in Missoula. I think it really was important in bridging the gap between Bozeman and Missoula. And then I think there's a lot of other communities that are benefiting from that. Um, I'd also like to say happy birthday, and I'd like all of you to join me at drinks, not right now, uh, <laughs> singing happy birthday, but uh, happy birthday, 42, 43, something like that. Yeah, yeah, almost. Great. <laughs> so my name is Tom Sturgis, I'm Senior Vice President of Corporate Strategy for APG. APG is a company that's headquartered in Kansas City, Missouri, um, but our largest office is right here in Missoula, Montana, actually literally on Main Street. So we have, um, as of this morning, our 93rd employee joined us here in Missoula. 104 total. Um, we've got some folks in Bozeman, Helena, uh, and Billings as well. And so we do some high-tech technology consulting. So some of the clients that you saw up there, Subaru, CenturyLink, and Kerr, uh, we do work helping them manage customers and revenue in new ways. So millennials have new buying habits. You may have heard of the subscription economy. Um, folks are borrowing some of the usage recurring and non-recurring charges that telecommunication companies use for decades. So we're now seeing all kinds of rentals that are out there and little old ATG from little old Missoula, Montana is working with companies from around the world. So we have about 60 different clients. Um, our consultants travel literally all around the world. We've had some in Frankfurt and London and um, Sydney, Australia. We do a lot of development work out of um, Argentina and Mexico and constantly in the Bay Area. And again, as Paige said, um, we have people come from all of these places and say, you know, I've been all around the world. This is a unique culture. It's kind of a blend of what's cool about Silicon Valley with what's cool about Chicago and the East Coast with what's really cool about the Clark Fork River. And we literally do do that. We work hard till about 4 o'clock when clients are there, and then we run over to the Shaw Roan exit, and we float on down to out to dinner Thursday night, and the clients get out and say, really? You're kidding me? I just had a full day of work, and then a float, and now I'm sitting here listening to live music. So it's a pleasure to be with you all, and I'll turn it over to Ron. Well, it's great to be here. I'm probably the, the newbie of newbies uh, on this panel. Um, first of all, uh, I spent uh, nearly the last 20 years in Austin, Texas, um, but now we have a place in Whitefish, Montana. So my wife and I go back and forth between Austin and uh, the northwest corner of Montana. So it's not Bozeman and it's not Missoula, but here I am. So I guess I'll talk about the what's not Bozeman and not, uh, not Missoula part of things. But uh, we're definitely spending more and more of our time uh, in Montana than in Texas, which I, I suppose to most of you in the room is highly predictable, but it, uh, it is working out that way. And um, I've worked in a lot of different industries, different parts of the world. Uh, I was brought in to run a company that was founded uh, up in Columbia Falls uh, by fourth generation Montanans. So the reason the company is in Montana is because it was in the gene pool in Montana that the founders wanted to do the company there. Uh, so I came on board in uh, uh, 2014 for a company that was founded back in 2009. And it's called Vision Energy Systems. Um, it is what's called uh, grid scale storage. So it's batteries the size of shipping containers. Uh, we are uh, going to be shipping those all over the world. Uh, this year, it's a uh, it's about a ten billion dollar industry um, right now. It'll probably be that big for a long, long time because basically renewables kind of grind to a halt at a certain uh, near trivial penetration if you don't figure out what to do about the fact that the sun doesn't shine all day and the wind often blows when you least want it to, and so you need to do something about the intermittency <coughs> of renewables if you're going to try to go to a clean tech way of generating electricity, and that's, that's what we're all about. Uh, we have some people in Austin, Texas, uh, the vast majority of our people are in our Columbia Falls facility. Um, and the other thing that's quite unique about Vision Energy Systems is that to date, we have been entirely 
funded by individuals. So we brought in about $46 million of paid in capital, uh, all from people. So we're actually working right now on our first and our last institutional round because fundraising is so much fun we want to do it just once um, and uh, and that's coming along quite well but uh, the company was not only founded by people from Montana but the original money to get the company going all came from individuals in Montana as well hi so I'm Kendall Ryder and I'm the uh, co-founder, a co-founder, and senior VP of product development of Animune, which is also right next door in the um, on tech incubator. Um, I'm actually here because our CEO is in a Bassmaster tournament in California, so I got, I got this job. Um, so I'll try and do my best to, to put a spin on. I'm a synthetic chemist by trade, so this is very uncomfortable for me. Um, but anyway, um, we're here um, actually, my group is here because we started out with GSK. Um, actually, most of them started with Rebium Unochem, which I'm not sure if you're familiar with. It's a little biotech company that started out at Rocky Mountain Labs down in, in, uh, in Hamilton. And if you want to talk about incubators, you know, that's one of them. That was founded by Edgar Rebe. He didn't want to leave the valley. The mountains reminded him of mountains in Switzerland, so he stayed. He formed a company. It was bought by um, Carixa, and then Carixa was bought by GSK. Um, and then my little research group hung on with GSK. I don't know how many of you know how hard it is to keep research going when you're involved in a big pharmaceutical company, but it's very hard. Um, they don't want to invest in R&D. Well, they want to invest in the D part of it, not the research part of it. Um, the development part is what they're most interested in. Um, so we basically, we're, we were entrepreneurs from the beginning, we were funding ourselves and our little research group for probably 20 years through NIH money, which is very important for small companies um, and our research. Um, and eventually, uh, GSK got got tired of us and decided to lay the research group off. Um, and uh, what they didn't realize is we had NIH contracts, which cannot be severed. You can't just stop work on them, um, their contracts. So they decided, since we didn't want to move to Maryland, <laughs> we want to stay here in Montana, that they'd let us transfer those grants to the University of Montana, which has been a great partner to work with. Um, and after moving all that, those $13 million worth of contracts and another five or $6 million worth of equipment from GSK to the university and to our new company, um, we were able to, to start Animune, and we've been doing that for about a year. Um, and also, contracting our services back to GSK, which is really nice because that's funding our internal research and our developments. We haven't able to go, or needed to go out and look for outside money yet until so we have a nice product and a nice portfolio to go forward with. Um, so that's really our story. Um, we haven't had to look at, at any other outside money because um, because we're supported through the university and, uh, and Montech, which has been a, a great resource for us and, and extremely great to work with. Um, so I guess I'll leave it there. And so I'm Paul Gladen. Uh, Christina wanted to be on the panel because she wanted an English accent, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> um, my story is a little different. I am actually an entrepreneur. I moved to Missoula in 2009, uh, sorry, 2008. Uh, helped set up a small kind of research and consulting business which still runs today, but um, have then sort of somehow accidentally fall in, fallen into all these other kind of startup activities. So back in 2009, um, bumped into Dawn McGee that's sitting right at the back there at a kind of conference at the Holiday Inn with like 100 people who were looking to raise money in Montana. And we were like, what are these people here? What are they trying to do? So Dawn and I said, let's get them together. And we formed a group called the Hellgate Venture Network, named after the canyon right outside there, um, and uh, invited a few people along the beer, and I think Tom came to that first meeting and wondered what the heck it was we were doing. But um, some people said it was useful and wanted, a, wanted us to do it again. So we've done it every month since. We now have a LinkedIn group of about 800 people, and uh, regularly get kind of between 30 and 50 people at our entrepreneurial network meet, networking meetings, and that's been 
great fun and we've drunk a lot of beer, so we've been contributing to the, the beer industry in the state as well. Um, more recently, had the great privilege to uh, help start the Blackstone Launchpad here at the University of Montana, which I think has been a tremendous program and tremendously exciting to be part of. Um, and then more recently, to be part of the co-founding team of the Montana Code School, uh, where we really saw a need in the community uh, to develop um, programming talent. Um, and that program, which we launched in um, the summer of 2015, um, has already graduated over 50 uh, junior programmers. We've got another 33 currently in our full-time and part-time programs in Missoula, Bozeman, uh, and in the part-time program. So uh, it's been a lot of fun to help kind of contribute in this amazing community of people um, to help support this entrepreneurial system grow. Thank you, Paul. So I'm going to throw this next question out to the group. Um, you're all building companies here to serve clients all over the world. No one is running a business just serving clients here locally. So the question is, why are you in Montana and what's unique about running a business here? So I, I guess I've got the mic, so I'll answer that quickly. So I, I, I came here um, partly because I was living in New York, and New York wanted to keep taxing me. Um, and I'd been visiting Missoula a few times, and it seemed like a pretty cool place to live, to ski, and all those kind of So it was things. quality of life. Quality of life. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> well, I guess my situation is, uh, is similar in the sense that quality of life is always going to come up as, as part of the answer to that. Um, but as I mentioned, the company, when I came here, was already in existence. So what it was was a development company. It's about 15 people doing pretty much just pure R&D. And so the question was, do you want to join a company that is in uh, Columbia Falls when you're in Austin, Texas, and you've been in a lot of different places around the world? And one of your A number one rules on any CEO commuting job, this is my fourth CEO job was, I will not take a position that's more than one plane hop from Austin, Texas, which of course does not include anywhere in Montana. <laughs> <laughs> which could be another one of your questions, I think. Um, and for me, and, and for my wife, I think the, the attractors of the area were so strong that that combined with what I saw being the business opportunity in the company was was really the tipping point. And then it was just, you know, we've been to Glacier National Park in 2008 on an anniversary trip, so, you know, maybe it was all sentimentality or whatever, but it's, uh, but it's proven out. And it's proven out not only for people we've been able to attract to the area from other parts of Montana, but from other parts of the country as well. So it's, uh, it's not a bad combination of and, and Ron, just given that you have come here recently, yeah. what would you say that's unique about running a business here compared to your experience in Austin? Uh, well, there's uh, probably not the comparable traffic jams. And <laughs> uh, I mean, Austin, is, Austin um, has done great as a high-tech ecosystem. You know, it's past 2 million people now, 180 people a day are moving to Austin, and at some point you kind of go, yeah, that was really not what I came here for, right? Um, so I think the biggest difference in coming to Montana is you fundamentally have to ask yourself a question about critical mass, and there's always there's always a question when you want to recruit people, because I've worked on these kinds of things in Michigan and in Texas and other places around the country. The person who isn't already here because of you know, float trips or whatever, is always going to ask himself a question, if I come to join this company in Columbia Falls and I'm super excited about it and I relocate my family, what if that company doesn't turn out to be where I can stay? Because it's not like Silicon Valley, it's not where they're going to change their company three times and not change their carpool, right? I mean, it's a big deal if it doesn't work out in some of these newer areas you're very, very likely headed into another family reload. And so that's, I think, the biggest issue is a critical mass issue and getting people comfortable with that kind of a move if they're not already familiar with the area. And that's where I think those other attractors have to be truly compelling 
or, or people just won't, they won't take that work-life balance risk. Yeah, thank you. Tom, why are you here and what's unique about running the business? Snakes. So I was uh, born and raised about a mile away, and when John Horner and I got bored of Bonner Park, we'd sneak on over to Jacob's Island and snow snakes and throw snakes at each other. So we didn't have video games, didn't have the internet, and so we had good old nature and Montana outdoors. And you know, I was born and raised and went away to college and, and, and didn't come back. I found myself in Washington, D.C. in 2003 with two young children, and I wanted them to throw snakes at each other. I wanted them to have that same kind of upbringing that I had. And, um, and and play baseball at Barn Park and all that other stuff. It had stuff. quite an impact on you, didn't it? It really did. It really did. It was a great place then and it still is a great place. And, and what's unique about doing business here is, knock on wood, six years into this experiment of doing world-class cloud-based technology in Missoula, you know, all of my key people are staying. And, and, and now they're growing into being very senior leaders and our relationships with the University of Montana are getting deeper and deeper. So the people that are graduating out of undergrad or MBA or even that much more ready to go into the global technology landscape. So it, it feels like there's, you know, the, the same reasons I came back is the same reason we have good employee retention. Just a great place to live. And when you can do great work, get great pay, and live in a great place, why would you leave? Um, so I'm originally from Mississippi, and we do not throw water moccasins and copper, copper heads at our children, but <laughs> sounds like great fun. Um, you know, my kids go to Lewis and Clark, and I just think that that's the best elementary school in the whole world, and it's free. And um, I, went to, I did a couple of grad degrees at the University of Montana, and I wanted to stay. And as a filmmaker, I was always, you know, possibly going to be pulled away to LA and um, I just kept coming back here because I hate traffic and um, I spend a lot of time in LA and San Francisco and New York and, and a little bit in DC and I would say the uniqueness of Montana is that you can get to here from here to Bozeman in two hours in the summer maybe a little less and um, you know you can go from Santa Monica to Hollywood in that same amount of time and it's only like 30 miles so that's huge and the other thing to me that's super unique for what we have compared to other places where I do business is just the relationships and the closeness with our political leaders and our um, support business resources. I mean, I, I just don't know another place where we can call up Deb and everyone who works, you know, even our own officials and just say, hey, I need to meet with you next week. And they're like, great, let's go. It's really special. Terrific. I want to switch and talk a little bit about the ecosystem that Yaz was talking about. If you could just highlight the types of support you got here that was particularly helpful to you during your startup process. And as we all know as entrepreneurs, you're never quite done, so. Um, I'll say the, 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 one of the most helpful things was when I was starting the Audience Awards, Joe was starting the idea of what Montech now is. And we were neighbors, and you know, it's a really small world. I, went to high school with his wife in, in Mississippi. And anyway, that's just me. But, um, so anyway, the, we were in some article, and it was talking about what Joe was doing, and it was talking about what I was doing, and so I called him up and said, hey, let's chat. And at the time, I had two interns working in my basement, and it was smoky because we tried to light a fire, and it hadn't been used in a long time, and it was just terrible and cold. And I called Joe and said, can we have some space? And you know we got it at a fraction of the cost of what it would be, and our our rent uh, moved as we moved, and it grew as we grew, and we still have beautiful space over there, and and um, that was just so helpful. The other relationship that really benefited the company while we were gaining traction and getting customers was having a great uh, banking relationship, and um, those are the two things that stand out to me right now. Four quick ones: first, University of Montana, David Firth, Cameron Lawrence, Paul Gladen and a host of others, just the access that we've had, the ability to go in and work with curriculum. I think it was just a tremendous win-win with the University of Montana. Uh, the Montana High Tech Alliance, and, and Greg in particular, you know, kept narrowing my hedgehog, um, and every time I narrowed it, we came, became more and more successful as a company. Uh, third, the Department of Commerce and Big Sky Trust Fund and Workforce Training Grants in the city of Missoula and the county of Missoula for their support in administering those grants. If you don't use them and you're running a business, you really should. Um, absolutely fantastic uh, program that takes coal severance tax and invests back into Montanans uh, for high paying jobs. And the fourth is my janitor. 
I've had the same janitor for six years, and, and I always said one day I'm going to acknowledge good old Seth. Uh, because he's just been fantastic, and every day I show up to a place that's easy to come in and go to work and nice and clean. <laughs> I don't know if I can top the janitor and the snakes. So. <laughs> well, I think for, for vision, we're, we're kind of just starting to scratch the surface of what we could do um, better in being more connected in with the, with the support for an ecosystem that is available in, in Montana. It's not something that, uh, that we've pursued very much in the past. It's one of the main reasons I started doing what I was doing with Christina uh, back uh, some bar. I was standing up on a table in Kalispell, I guess, uh, talking about vision. And uh, we really do want to plug in more at a state level, uh, not just at a, at a city or a local level, and, and really better understand what's out there because we know it's there, but it's really up to us to go do the right job. That's what we're in the middle of right now, and that's one of the reasons I'm here. Yeah, I guess uh, the vision that, that they've had with the university and, and Montech and that whole incubator system kind of translated very nicely into, into keeping all the talent that, that my group has in the state. You know, we had the opportunity to move to Maryland. I'm not sure why we ever want to do that, right? We, all of us have kids here. We, We've been here a long time, we want to stay, but we couldn't have done that without the university and their support and, and allowing us to transition. And we also started a new center within the university that I hope will get approved here pretty soon. It's called the Center for Translational Medicine. Um, and we're also kind of collaborating with the University of Mon or Montana State. Um, so it's a mechanism where you know people that have been involved in pharmaceutical, big pharmaceutical product development, um, for many years can help professors um, access that talent and, and understand what it takes to get a product from conception to um, potential commercial um, um, level. Um, you know, we, our group has taken three compounds now into the clinic, um, actually four. Um, one of them is in a commercial vaccine worldwide, another one was in a commercial vaccine in Argentina, and, and another one is, is in clinical trials right now. And that's you know, the kind of expertise that we can offer to professors at the university. And, and a big part of that is protecting your intellectual property. If you don't have that intellectual property, you've got nothing to sell. <laughs> so, um, and a lot of professors don't realize that. They're, they're in a rush to publish, they're in a rush to to get their name out there and, and to keep their grants coming in. And you can't get grants if you don't have publications. But if you don't have IP, you just have publications. So yeah, I really, I think the vision of, of moving things from, from academia to, to uh, concept and, and, and a business um, is, is really something that the university is doing really well right now. All the universities really right now. Um, I was, Talking to someone a few months ago about what it what it is I do at the launch pad or what we do and um, describing how it's connecting people and this guy just said so you're just a human router then and, um, and like that's actually a pretty good kind of summary a pretty good analogy and that's um, kind of one of the great things I think about being an entrepreneur in Montana is that we have this amazing network of people with tremendous expertise tremendous networks tremendous experience and those people are very happy and very willing to share that time and that expertise and that network. So I think that's something I get a lot of satisfaction out is trying to sort of remove the friction in the process and help people get connected to the expertise and resources that we have in the state. So panelists, we have successfully made it to the lightning round. The last two questions, and I'm going to shorten them up because we're the only thing between us and the reception outside. Um, in, a, in a word or two, take up to 10 seconds. What's the biggest challenge that you face in your business for sustained growth? Or what, in your case, Paul, what do you hear from the clients that are coming into the launch pad? Access to talent. Access to talent. I would agree with that. I would say ours is the perception that uh, outside Montana is still pretty big in the venture capital world. But it just must be really, really hard to build a high-tech company in Montana. Mm -hmm. And uh, I spend a lot of time working on raising money, and one of the things I do is I keep beating down that uh, preconceived notion. 
Airfare. Airfare and talent. Yeah, okay. Airfare and talent. Yeah. Okay, one last question here. Given all this discussion, first I want to thank the panelists. But in our last question, um, what do you think, and again, this is also a lightning round question, so we'll keep them short so we can go out. And then I believe all the panelists are going to stay for the reception. She'll have a chance to interact one-on-one -on -one outside. But what do you think leaders in education, public sector, or other support organizations can do to help entrepreneurs in Montana based on your experience? What should we do? <laughs> You're passing. I think we. We're, I think the number one job of the, is what we're doing today, and that is getting the Montana story out. Yeah, leadership density and training. Um, when we take junior consultants, they go back into the classroom and instruct. They they kind of grow up a little bit. They feel a little bit of leadership, and then we bring the students into our office, and they grow up a little bit. So there's so many opportunities when you engage public-private with the university system, and even with the high school system, and even in the grade school system, we're in the fourth grade teaching fourth grade STEM to kids, and they start to see it, and then you see your, your consultants get some, some energy from that as well, so engagement. I would say friendly technology transfer out of universities so the new companies can have value. Yeah, I would have to say that funding at the at the grassroots level. Um, obviously, that that little bit of seed money, that that two hundred and fifty to a million dollar seed money that you would need, especially for a biotech, um, is is critical, and that that money's fairly hard to get. Um, you know, that's the money you need to get that your your intellectual property established, your preclinical work done to a point where you can actually bring in some VC money and and really start going and. And I think that's really missing. And I'll take something that Yaz shared with us at lunch, because um, we asked him to compare what he saw here with other places he studied. And his sort of takeaway was we should have confidence in what we're doing. What we're doing is as good as anywhere else in the country, and we should be proud of that and take that confidence forward. Um, is there anything any of the panelists wanted to share with the audience that we didn't get to that you'd like to take a minute to do? I have one. I just said we got to keep our kids here and we got to retain. It's all about keeping high schoolers coming to University um, of Montana, Montana State, anywhere in the state, and then inviting those people that are Montanans or love Montana to come back because the water is warm and friendly. Yeah. And anybody else? Yeah, you know, I was just going to make a comment about being in, in one of the smaller cities that's not, that's not Bozeman or, or Missoula. I would say on the one hand, it isn't really a difference in terms of logistics because it's easy. It's as easy to fly into Kalispell as, as Missoula or Bozeman. You still have to go through Salt Lake, Denver, whatever. Um, but I think the one thing that is different is you don't have the major university up there. Uh, that hasn't been an issue for us because it seems like anybody who goes to university in Montana is pretty happy being anywhere in Montana. But the logistics issue, airfare issue, is pretty much the same for our small town environment as it is as it is here. Okay. Um, please join me in welcome with thanking these panelists. Thank you. I would just like to say two more things before we break and go enjoy refreshments. Uh, the first is to thank our sponsors. Uh, again, thank you to ATG for sponsoring the printing of, of these materials. I hope you will uh, read the report either online or, or in hard copy. One of my favorite points, one of my favorite nuggets that's in there is that the quality of people that live in Montana and who are attracted to Montana have shaped this business community and that the grit and resilience of a Montana resident is part of what drives entrepreneurship in this state. Um, the second thing I'd like to thank uh, Blackfoot, our host and sponsor for this presentation and reception tonight. They're the host for uh, the, the drinks and um, hors d'oeuvres that you will enjoy. So thank you to them. Let's give them a round of applause.